But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind, whatsoever I have said to you. Words taken from St. John's Holy Gospel, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. To begin this sermon this morning on Pentecost Sunday, I would like to first speak of two men. One man is a canonized saint who was filled with the spirit of truth, while the other man was possessed by a spirit of falsehood and deception. So let's begin. St. Philip Neri was from Florence, Italy, but he came to love the eternal city of Rome. As a young man living in Rome, it was St. Philip's custom to spend whole nights in prayer in the catacombs, those underground burial places of the early Christians. On the vigil of Pentecost in 1544, St. Philip was praying in those catacombs of St. Sebastian, as he had done many times in the past. And there he asked the good Lord to fill him with the gift of the Holy Ghost evermore. St. Philip, it is said, was suddenly filled with great joy and saw from a distance in the catacombs an image of the Holy Ghost as a large ball of fire. This ball of fire then began to race towards the young man and eventually entered into the very mouth of St. Philip and descended into his heart, causing his very ribs to break because the heart grew twice its normal size. A physical fact that was later proved when an autopsy was done on his body. St. Philip later said that it filled his whole body with such a joyous, fiery presence that he finally had to throw himself down the ground and cry out to the Lord, No more, Lord, no more. During Philip's lifetime, many people noticed that he seemed always to be warm. He was often flushed and ruddy in complexion. And he would walk around with his cassock unbuttoned at the chest, even in the midst of the coldest winters. Not only that, but several of his disciples reported that his heart used to beat violently when he prayed or preached, sometimes enough to shake the bench on which they were sitting. Some people would hear his heart beating all the way across from the room, and others experienced unspeakable peace and joy when he embraced them and held them close to his heart. This was true. His disciples testified that they would often, often warm themselves by laying their heads upon his chest or even just sitting outside the door of his room. The Holy Ghost had filled the mind of St. Philip with the spirit of truth and enkindled his heart with the fires of divine love. And with his complete docility, to the movements of the Holy Ghost, St. Philip Neri became the third apostle of Rome after Saints Peter and Paul, as well as being one of the greatest saints of what is known as the Catholic Reformation, along with St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Teresa of Jesus. Like a cloud is moved by the gentlest wind, St. Philip was ever responsive to the breath and wind of the Spirit. The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost were like sails, ever open to catch the wind as he served countless pilgrims who came to Rome to visit the saints. He aided the sick and dying. He promoted 40 hours devotions before the Blessed Sacrament. He spiritually directed and formed many men literally into saints. And he took various pilgrimages within Rome with people following in procession. He founded the Oratorian brothers and priests, and he brought a wondrous joy to the hearts of all. As St. Philip Neri often said, a joyful heart is more easily made perfect than a downcast heart. But the second man, the second man is named Father Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit priest of the 20th century a geologist and paleontologist obsessed with evolutionism, and he was therefore a pseudo-theologian. Chardin also had 
an encounter with a spirit of sorts. But it was not the fire of the Holy Ghost, but rather another sort of spirit that may have come from the deepest abyss. Chardin describes his encounter with this spirit. This is his writings, which he simply called the thing, the thing. While in the desert, Father Teilhard de Chardin observed the thing swooping down towards him. Then suddenly, again, he's describing it, a breath of scorching air passed his forehead, broke through the barrier of his closed eyelids, and penetrated into his very soul. Chardin felt he was ceasing to be merely himself, and then an irresistible rapture took possession of him as though all the oozing sap of all living things were flowing into his heart at one moment. Chardin then adds that while he felt connected with the entire universe, which he saw as divine, he also felt the anguish of some superhuman peril oppressing him, which brought about a confused feeling that he perceived. The thing as being a combination of both good and also evil. The spirit known as the thing then addressed, spoke to Chardin saying, you called me here and here I am. He who has once seen me can never forget me. He must either damn himself with me or save me with himself, unquote. Whatever this spirit, this thing was, it helped guide Father Teilhard de Chardin to teach and promote errors which deceived many of the faithful. As Pope Pius XII of Holy Memory remarked, Chardin's writings were a, quote, cesspool of errors, unquote. Chardin wanted a new religion, perhaps one that the thing would be pleased with. Chardin states that he wanted, quote, a new and better Christianity, where the personal God ceases to be this great monolithic proprietor of the past, to become the soul of the world, which the stage we have reached religiously and culturally calls for, unquote. Yes, he wanted a new religion, where God is not transcendent above it all and distinct from creation, but rather a pantheistic God that was part of creation. Evolutionism would be an article of faith in his new religion, where all things, including God himself, evolve, change. Christ is not perfect God and perfect man, but rather subject to and influenced by evolution. In fact, his words, Christ is saved by evolution. His religion, the religion of the thing, was pure naturalism. In his new religion, supernatural grace, which saves our souls, was replaced by a cosmic progression that leads to what he calls an end point, an omega point of human perfection, a new agey transhumanism, where the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations, especially by science and technology, by natural means. When someone mentioned to him, the doctor of grace, St. Augustine, the greatest father of all, when someone mentioned to Chardin, St. Augustine, Chardin exclaimed violently, don't mention that unfortunate man in my presence. He spoiled everything by introducing the supernatural, unquote. Father Teilhard de Chardin was not moved by the Holy Ghost, was not moved by the spirit of truth, but rather moved by the thing, a spirit from the abyss. And it's no wonder then that the Holy See spoke out strongly against the writings of this man. Pope John XXIII and Cardinal Taviani, back in the 50s and 60s, warned Catholics by stating the following, the statement of the Holy See, quote, 
it is sufficiently clear that many of the works of Chardin abound in some ambiguities and indeed even serious errors, and they offend Catholic doctrine, unquote. And despite this grave warning, however, Chardin continues to influence greatly the membership of the church. We may not see it, but it's there. Part of a conciliar document of Vatican II, namely Gaudium et Spes, one of the documents of the council, could seemingly have been written by the likes of Chardin. It reads the following, quote, The human race has passed from a rather static concept of reality to a more dynamic and evolutionary one. Man is on the way to a more thorough development of his personality. A little transhumanism there. We are witnessing the birth of a new humanism, unquote. Recent popes have praised this man, and more than a few churchmen and theologians have asked that Father Teilhard de Chardin be named the next doctor of the church. To adapt the famous quotation from St. Jerome, who once spoke of the influence of the ancient error of Arianism, the whole world groaned, Jerome wrote, and was astonished to find itself Arian. We can say the membership of the church today is groaning under the weight of the influence of Chardin and is astonished to find itself Teardian in its beliefs. Dear people, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth whose duty, whose office is to strengthen the faith of the disciples, to bestow wisdom and knowledge and to confirm the true teachings of Christ in our very souls. The truth is a person, a divine person come in the flesh. Christ is that truth, and the Holy Ghost is his witness. When we are in conformity with Christ, we are in conformity with the truth. Truth is what it is. Things that exist are what they are. There is truth, and because there is truth, we can study and we can investigate, and our questions do have answers, truthful answers. Our minds are not meant to create their own reality, but the primary function of the mind is to discover and to conform to Christ and the created order that he made. The human mind is not independent. It's not alone. It has no license to create its own versions of the truth, things are what they are. But in this modern world in which we live, the spirit of truth has been put aside in favor of the spirit of the thing, the spirit of deception, which comes from the fathers of lies. This obvious problem today is written about in a wonderful book that would be beneficial for you to read. And this is hugely important in an age of deception. This book is called Out of the Ashes by the author and professor known as Anthony Esselin. Out of the Ashes, Anthony Esselin was the author. A must read to say the least. In the beginning, it is said that Adam named the things in creation and he gave them proper names. He named them truly. We need to give things their true name. We need to reconnect with the nature of things that God created. But as the original sin committed by our first parents was to embrace the lie spoken by the serpent, so deceit rules the day in the modern world. Most slogans today in the world are lies. For our language has been corrupted by deceit. And so we're told that a woman soldier can perform just as well as a male soldier on the field of battle. It's an obvious lie, but most of us swallow it. We're told that sodomical couples can unite and even marry. And they're just as good at parenting as a real mom and dad. It's a lie. We're told that gender is purely a social construction something that is fluid, liable to change, that a boy can become a girl and a girl become a boy if they identify as such. 
We're told that we have 12 years left before the earth is destroyed. And mass education and mass media spread these lies daily and people soak it in. History books tell us that the Catholic Church is the enemy of freedom. That the church has killed millions at the stake. That the church somehow caused the genocide of the Jews. We are told that an unborn child is simply a blob of flesh. We're told that diversity is our strength. (laughs) Though we clearly know that it is often the greatest weakness. We live in an age of agendas, not truth. Chardin helped give us the evolutionary hoax that Piltdown Man, and we have swallowed as Catholics the deception of evolution. What is the cure? For Anthony Esselin, that author I mentioned earlier, the answer is to embrace reality, to look at the nature of things, and to read good books. You know, most of us today in the modern world don't know a good wild mushroom from a poisonous one. We have no clue. Most of us don't know what kind of bait to use to catch a certain fish or where to look for Jupiter in the night sky or how to properly tap a maple tree. We just don't know how to do it. As Anthony Esselin states, we are strangers to the world and to nature, but we're not strangers to lies and the spirit of the world. Of course, this spirit of deception also finds a place within the membership of the church. The thing of Chardin has seemingly conquered the minds of Catholics. We're told that hell exists, but there's a good hope that it's probably empty. Purgatory is just a medieval fable, we're told. St. Paul was a misogynist. Lies, lies, and more lies. Our Lord did not know that he was God, they tell us, until his baptism. Martin Luther was a great reformer that did not mean to bring about division. The Holy Ghost inspired the founders of all religions. Lies, lies, lies. Mary's virginity was not so much a physical reality, but only a moral condition. It's impossible to commit mortal sin. Practically impossible. The body of Christ includes more than just Catholics, we're told. Lies. It's okay to pray actively in non-Catholic worship. I mean, we're at ecumenical, right? Lie. Men have the right to follow whatever religion they like according to their own conscience. Lie. The Crusades and Inquisitions were pure evils that violated the gospel of Christ as well as human dignity. Not using contraceptives to regulate birth is the ideal, they tell us, but not an absolute demand, not a commandment. Marriage for life is an ideal, but not expected of all couples. This is too high a bar for some. We need to appreciate the love present in same-sex unions. Appreciate it. Lie. Lies, lies, and more lies everywhere. We should never condemn, but only affirm. Muslims and Christians worship the same God. Really? The mystical body of Christ is found in other religious groups. Lie. Salvation of the means of sanctification is found outside the Catholic Church. Lie. And the list goes on and on. More lies from the thing. The truth must be restored. We need a restoration of truth-telling and hate the lies of the serpent. Therefore, we need to learn to read and to read the Council of Trent documents, which are clear. Traditional authors who are clear. To learn to listen to the teachings of the fathers and the doctors and traditional theologians. May that same Holy Ghost that came into the very heart of St. Philip Neri come to us on this day. And may the thing that entered into Teilhard de Chardin be cast into hell. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.